This gentleman let me ride in his private jet to go see my mother for a couple hours. And I got to hear him doing deals and how he viewed uh, money and real estate. And I asked him questions about it. And those things have, I've been using them ever since. When we got to Austin, we only owned one thing. And that was Alexi's house that she bought when she was 25. We own five houses outside of the three that are on this property. And he helped me get this property. So without further ado, everybody give a warm welcome to the man, the myth, the legend, my friend, the killer, David Osborne. David, thank you for being here, bro. Great I to really be with you. you. What a yes. nice introduction. I should record that and play it to myself every morning. I, I wake up happier every single day. Thanks, Preston. David, can you share with people what it is that you do, because uh, there's multifacets to it, but what is it that you actually do in the world that makes you all this money and, and well, helps you experience the abundance that you do? What do I do? You know, spiritually, I manifest. Uh, practically, I started off building a residential real estate company in 1995, six, seven ish. Mm. And ended up building one of the largest residential real estate companies in the world. Uh, we do a lot of transactions. Um, and then from there, I built an entrepreneurial mastermind called GoBundance. Yes. And GoBundance has a thousand members. And then from there, I also created a private equity fund that invests in cash flowing assets for our investors. So we've, we've raised quite a bit of money. Uh, almost everything I do is in the medium scale. So there's huge people and then there's small people and then there's the medium in business. And I'm always in the kind of the medium, uh, kind of the barbell part of it all. Um, and I've just kind of manifested different businesses with a with a philosophy and a strategy that uh, I've just repeated over and over again. And I could keep repeating it over and over again for a lifetime. Uh, I'm just more interested now in, in more kind of personal transformation. So I've been working on some other things uh, with the last few years of my life. Hell yes. I love that. And what is it that you, when you look back, right? You're like, oh, I produce. I mean, you, from a, not that this matters, but from a scale perspective, you're calling yourself medium, but. Right. Well, I compare myself to a pretty high standard. So <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh, but, I'm, I'm medium yeah, compared to yeah, Warren yeah. Beth Buffett. Like yes. you're not medium in any sense of the word to true, us. True, 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 right? true, true. I, so, I, I, I get, I get it. I'm just saying like, when I look out there, like I always try to keep it real. Like one of my yes. strategies actually in successes for life is to keep it real. Like I think we are easily deluded. We easily delude ourselves and we yeah. easily delude others. So if you live in this story of like something you're going to do, for instance, people, I see this all the time. I'm going to go start a coaching company. I'm going to have a thousand clients and I'm going to buy a house on the beach in Costa Rica. You can almost get enough energy out of just telling that story to spend your entire life telling that story without doing any of it. Yes. And so that's not keeping it real. And it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Actually, it's kind of fun to talk to somebody at a party that tells you all their dreams and the amazing things they're going to do. It's unlikely to come true unless you're willing to sort of do the things necessary to get you there. And, and I think a lot of times you can just get a high from talking about your visions and your goals mm -hmm. and people validate you because people are very kind. So they're like, that's awesome. Good for you. And that becomes like the circle you live in. What I've always tried to do is kind of be real with myself. Like I'm not going to build a thousand coaching companies unless I start making calls and building what I want to build. I'm not going to get that house in Costa Rica. You know, what exactly are the steps I have to do today to end up building that coaching company so I can get the house in Costa Rica? So I do downplay and pour water a little bit on what I've accomplished, mainly because I want to keep it real and not be diluted by my own sort of narcissism or self uh, grand, uh, uh, grand, I don't know exactly what, what, what the word is. So I try to keep it real. So yes, I've done well. It's been a good run. Okay. So I love this on every level. And I would also categorize you as somebody who keeps it real, right? Like you're extremely humble, extremely giving. And as an outsider insider, I, and all our friends can look at you and go, of course, David is rich as fuck because he's so generous. Did the generousness start when you got rich? 
Or no, was I was it? always generous. I always loved giving to people. In fact, I read a study recently, which is really cool. And I, I don't know where it is. I have to go look it up. But it said that if you give a little kid like a, a, a an M&M, they're thrilled. But if you then tell that kid to take that M&M and give it to somebody else and they read their facial expressions, they're actually happier. Mm. So you're they're really happy to receive the candy. Maybe if they didn't get to eat one, they wouldn't be as happy. But if they get to eat one and then they get to give one to another one, you see them going over and knowing they're about to give something good to someone else and seeing the re response, they're actually even happier giving. And somewhere in my life, being generous just resonated with me. And I think maybe I just... I just saw so much scarcity and I thought, what if I went the other direction? You know, you just see so many people with fear and tightness and sort of holding back. And I was like, what if I went the other direction? And maybe even in my family life, there was scarcity. My mom was a World War II baby and she, you know, washes out Ziploc baggies. She used to clean tinfoil to reuse the tinfoil. And uh, we tell everyone in our family to start throwing it out. We're like, we are not using reused tinfoil. We're drawing the line right there. Um, but that was how she was. She saved and used everything. And maybe that just drove me crazy. But it's somewhere along the lines, being generous resonated with me. And I just followed that resonance. Yep. Okay. So I asked you about money a yeah. few years ago. And you told me something uh, along the lines of, I asked you, do you save? And, and you spoke to, and I'm not going to say too much here, because I want you to talk about it. The difference between money defenders and money makers essentially right. is how i heard it can you right. expand on that because that fucking blew my mind like well, every really... you, you can't save your way to wealth you can save your wife way, way to comfort you just can't save your way to wealth i mean and there could be exceptions if you're a ball player uh, you're gonna constantly hear me hedging just because i like to be real like i said earlier so yes if you make 10 million a year you can save all that money and probably be just fine but generally speaking, if you're making 70 grand a year or 80 grand a year, 100 grand a year or 50 grand a year, you can't save your wealth to significant. You can't save your way to significant wealth. You have to deploy the money and invest the money wisely. And I look at each dollar as an employee and I want that dollar to go out and make me 10 cents a year. So that's that's how I look at dollars. So I don't look at five thousand dollars as five thousand bucks. I look at five thousand dollars as uh, five hundred dollars a year. Right. Or, or I look at $50,000 as $5,000 a year, or I look at $100,000 as $10,000 a year. And I wasn't that good at math. So if I got any of those wrong, you guys will know, you can check, check me on my, but you get the idea is like every dollar is an employee. And I want that employee to go to work and find a productive place to work. And that's through investing. Now you have to be very careful with investing. So when I say that, I just want you to know that I've made a thousand mistakes. I was able to generate a lot of money, which covered up a lot of my mistakes uh, but generally speaking, I've got very good at trying to figure out how to place my money so that it goes to work for me. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. So that's how I view it is you can't save your way to wealth. You can only, or, you know, defenders are people that like don't go to Starbucks. They cook their coffee at home and they don't, you know, eat out. They cook at home and they do all these things. They drive a, a, a small car that gets really good gas mileage. And that's great because it gives you extra resources to invest. That. In and of itself, while it's a useful skill, it won't get you to where you want to be if you're trying to be financially free. Yeah. So I, that's hope, I hope everybody is letting this land. Drop a one in the comments if this is hitting for you. This is a guy who I also look up to and aspire to experience the financial wealth and the, the, the actual internal freedom that he operates from. Again, this is my friend and it's my mentor. This dude is fucking nuts and funny and interesting and super generous and like extremely open. And David, can you speak to, because you also, right, you have GoBundance, which is, you know, and you wrote a book, right? A Tribe of Millionaires and all that stuff. You're around rich ass people all the time. Yeah. There is a narrative that Hollywood has sold us that you do not fit into. And I'm, I'm pretty sure your yeah. friends don't either. Can you speak it to that? Yeah, sure. A lot of times people think rich people are evil or they're greedy. Um, and all I would say is my experience of most, and I know a lot of guys, I'm in a group where to get in the group, you have to have a hundred million net worth. The average net worth three or 400 million. And my experience of wealthy people is they're flawed. They're no different than any other else, anyone else. If they were greedy when they came in, they stay greedy. If they were generous when they came in, but almost all of them have taken up a cause of some sort, put millions and millions of dollars. A lot of times they do it unspoken and unheralded. They're not looking for the glory. Um, and most of the rich guys I know do a lot with charity. They contribute a lot. Now they're flawed humans. A lot of times to build a lot of wealth, some people come from some trauma or from some different things. 
But my experience by and far is that they are extraordinarily generous and they will give you a lot of time. When I was coming up, I would reach out to a lot of wealthy people because I was constantly looking for role models, people that I wanted to be like. And I would reach out to them and ask for their time. And they generally say, no, they might ignore me five or six times. But if I just kept persisting, then I would generally get an opportunity to have lunch with them. And that's what I used to do. I'd say, hey, what would I have to do to earn lunch with you? Uh, hey, I'd just check pinging you again. I'd just love to take you to coffee. Hey, I'm just... And then at that lunch, I would sit down and I would ask them questions. And, and the first five or six questions would be ego-based questions to make them feel good, which would be, tell me about you know who you are, how you got here, what made you successful. And then the second part would be whatever I was interested in. Are they good investors? Are they good at um, real estate? What are, what are they good at private equity? And that would be specific to where I was trying to go. And then I would try to adopt their traits. So if you know, if a guy said, you know, I'm I'm very hardworking, I'd be like, okay, well, that's pretty much a given, but maybe I can be hardworking. Um, and then they would almost always have a charity. So in my discovery of their journey and what got them to where they were, Habitat for Humanity one was one, Dell Children's Hospital was another, you know, their church, wherever it was, there was a lot of lot of money being contributed to different causes. Um, charity Water was a big one, you know, for for mm -hmm. building clean water wells all around the world. And uh, it was just astonishing to me how often that would happen. And then after the lunch or the meeting that I eventually got after persisting, by the way, some people never responded. So it wasn't a hundred percent, but you know, I did, I never took that personally. They're busy. So it's just, if, if they have the time, I'd appreciate the time. Then I would donate money to their favorite charity and I'd send them a note saying, Hey, I know I really can't make a difference in your life, but I just want, you know, I've gave a hundred bucks or 50 bucks to mm. Habitat for Huma Humanity or Charity Water, uh, just as a way of honoring you for the time you, you you gave me or 500. As I got older, it was like bigger checks, obviously. And then over time, a lot of those people became my peers. Now of all the traits that they would always say, um, you know, there was only one that always showed up. And the one that always showed up was I'm persistent or I never give up or I don't quit or uh, I, I stay on, you know. And so what I learned from that is just that one of the secrets to wealth is just never quitting, you know. And, and that doesn't mean you can't have a really bad week and quit on Friday, as long as on Monday you wake back up and say, okay, I unquit and I go back to work. Does that make yes. sense? So never quitting, being persistent, being tenacious, hanging in there was always a part of it. And then the second part, I noticed a, a theme on it, wasn't always a trait, but they always had a clarity on where they wanted to go. So like I said at the beginning of the example of a thousand coaches so I can have a house in Costa Rica, they always had wealthy people seem to often almost always have clarity on a direction they want to go. Now, they might change that. They might course adjust, but they generally have a pretty clear vision for their life. And huh. I think that's what I notice with people that don't have that, don't have a lot of successes. It seems like consistently they're not really that clear on where yeah. they want to go. Facts. Okay. So watch this because um, I want you, you are especially set up to answer this question. I've, I've been inviting them to join me in something called the Spiritual Millionaire Academy, where I'm going to you know, hook them up and it's, it's around proximity. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to the idea of the rich getting richer? Yeah. Why, do you, why do you think that happens? Well, you hit on two things actually inside of that thing, but one of them is resonance. And I think it's very important that the that wealthy people resonated a certain way of being, right? So you really want to, that's why I would go meet these wealthy people or join the wealthy clubs, even though they're expensive or spend 50 grand to go meet Richard Branson on his island. Not because I want to be a fanboy, because I'm definitely not a fanboy, but I want to be in their presence to resonate, see how they resonate. And there's a certain resonance that wealthy people have that you can absolutely absorb into your nervous system nice. and also um, practice and develop over time. And that resonance is sort of a confidence, um, a, a, a knowingness that you won't quit, a knowingness that you're tenacious, even though you might quit Friday and go back to work Monday. So I want to be clear that I don't put into your head that not quitting is like some heroic, like I never fall down. I never get beaten. No, sometimes you're like just beat down. You're like, I'm out. And then you're like, you know, after I've had some rest, maybe I'm not out, I'm back in. So it's kind of, you know, it, but deep inside your soul knows whether you're being real, so you're telling the truth and B, whether you're doing the steps that need to be taken to get to where you want to go. And as you do that over and over, over 10, 15, 20, 30 years, you kind of build up this inner muscle that resonates with other highly successful people because they have that same resonance. Um, so it's really important that you learn to resonate your frequency with that of wealth and with that of people that do what it takes to be wealth. Like right now I'm resonating with you. And if you're picking up some, what I'm offering, I'm not bragging. I, I have the wealth resonance because I developed it over 20 years, That's 30 years longer, actually, of just really 
making sure I do what I say and I say what I mean, just keeping my integrity mm. in alignment with my goals and my vision. And that's a, that's a muscle you have to develop. And I didn't have it at first. I was a procrastinator. I was ter- a C student. Um, but once I chose a path, I just built that over time. And the best way for me to learn that was to hang out with other highly successful people. Facts. Um, yeah. I think so, you asked another question, but I forgot the second part of the question. No, you nailed it, bro. I'm going to okay. go to one other thing that I think is super important that I see you doing. Again, um, people like yourself can be these like far off things for some people. And they're like, oh, it's them. They have something we don't have, et cetera, et cetera. What you just said to me is such gold. And how I interpret it is you shorten the gap between what you say and who the fuck you actually are and how you show up. So if you say, I'm going to do this, you shorten the gap, mm-hmm. right? Some people talk to the cows come home, but the gap is over here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Watch this. David and I work out together, right? You guys see these guns? You see these guns, right? Oh, there we go. Oh, yours are looking good, man. You've been working out. I see. I'm, wor- I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Who do you think is stronger? Me or David? Put it in the comments. Put a P or a D. Who do you think is stronger? I like somebody up there pointed at themselves. That's the right answer. Yes, yes, it is. Fuck you guys for putting him because he actually is stronger than me. And I, th- I think, right? And what are you well, doing? You kind of set it up for me, by the way, just so you know, that was a setup. It was a layout. Sure, but we could see your muscles, bro. Like, <laughs> So we work out together and I see the commitment you have because it's the, the game is how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm-hmm. Can everybody just let that land for a moment? How you yeah. do anything is how you do everything. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a person who has millions and millions and millions and could just walk away and not do fucking anything ever for the rest of his life. And yet, out of a commitment to his family, to his community, to the people he still supports, he takes care of himself. What are you, 57? 57. 57 years old. This dude's stronger than me. He's not on a bunch of drugs. He's not shooting himself up. He's no, just no testosterone, bro. No T, not yet. I'm not saying no forever, but not yet. Correct, right? But that's the beauty. That's what I want them to see and understand. We go to work out. This guy stays consistent. He shortens the gap. He says, "I'm going this way. I'm going this way." Hmm. I yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. love that. That was a skill that I had to develop. I want. I want to be clear. Like I, I had a procrastination gene when I was younger, and it's important for people to understand that all of these things are just skills. And if you start, you know, like I got my son who's seven in golf and he's going to be a great golfer. He's going to be a way better golfer than me at 12. And he's lucky that I'm his dad because that's what he's going to get as a gift. (laughs) But my dad couldn't afford to do that. We didn't have that option. But if you it's just consistency and steadiness and applying an application to things you love. And that's the way and then never quitting. And if you just choose something and you apply yourself and you never quit. That's the pathway. It's not like an easy think and grow. It's not like a, it's not like magic fairy dust. It's just that consistency towards your goal. And then be being willing to make mistakes, being willing to put yourself out there, forgiving yourself for making mistakes, accepting the mistakes, knowing that's part of the journey. Um, that's kind of, that's the simple means of getting to where you go. And it took me 30 years or more to get to where I'm at. And it definitely has been, I felt the the alignment from my more fuzzy, you know, this is what you say and this is what you do to, to bring that into overlap mm. to where like, it's pretty good now. Like I might have an 80% overlap of what I say and what I do. When yes. I started, it might've been 5% or 1%, you know, and that's called your, your concentricity, like how much you line up with what you say and what you do. Mm. And that's really the game is to align that concentricity up to get what you say and what you do in alignment because then the universe takes you seriously but more importantly you take yourself seriously because you know that you're going to do what you say and by the way again the reason i mentioned forgiveness is you have to forgive yourself constantly it doesn't matter if you fail it just matters if you don't get back up and try again if you say i'm going to the gym this week and you don't go once that's fine but just be aware of it be conscious of it and either choose to not go to the gym and say i don't go to the gym then you're in alignment or say, I'm going to go do the gym and do it. You know, that's the secret. Because mm. the more you know you are uh, serious to yourself, you know, if you, if you speak the word and the word becomes true, you know, if you do what you say, you become a stronger person. And that's my whole journey. My whole life is aligning my word with my actions. 